Welcome everybody. If you have never been with me before, my name is Sven Masterson. This is my wife, Zelda. And we live in central Pennsylvania, about halfway between Pittsburgh and Philadelphia in what we affectionately call Pennsylvania. And today we're here to talk to you about um, just things we've learned in uh, 30 years of relationship, 27 of that married. Um, we're fortunately in a good place in our relationship, but it wasn't always that way. And one thing that really uh, almost torpedoed things for me, I believe, and for us, was this idea of ha having no real skills or understanding uh, for how to really um, understand when, when Zelda would raise concerns or issues, things that felt like they kept coming up over and over again. Right, and so the title for this today is, you know, why do women, why won't your wife let go of the past and what you can do to stop it? Um, and so we're just gonna have an unscripted conversation about these things. And um, we just ask that if you have a question that you raise your hand, um, actually just put it in the chat and Charlie will moderate those for us. And if you keep yourself muted, just to keep the, uh, the sound distractions to a minimum, I'd appreciate it. So if you saw in the outlines for the live tribe call today, I mentioned that we would be talking about three things. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about each of those three things. We'll break for a moment and answer a question or two, and then we'll move on to the next section. Right? Anything you wanna say? I just would like to say hello. <laughs> All right, so why do women bring up the past or bring up the current is there even a difference? Probably a good thing to ask. And what do they want? So I'm going to actually let Zelda explain uh, from a, a woman's point of view, why is she bringing really anything up um, in the relationship, especially if it's something that keeps coming up? And what would possess a woman to want to do that? Because as a man, I may have already apologized for it. In fact, a lot of times I did, right? And so... I don't know if you want to tell a story, that's fine. Um, <laughs> I feel like we, we both actually have done this meaning. As men, we forget that men do this too. Meaning men will keep bringing up anything they felt, feel like is unresolved. But when you're in a conflict stage of marriage, which is where most of us get to know one another, there's a lot of attempt uh, from us as men to try to repair, right? And so that's usually an opportunity. We're looking for opportunities. Like, what did I do wrong? What's the matter? And so um, maybe we want to move forward as men, but you might keep, like every time we talk to you as women, you might just bring something up again that we feel like, didn't I already apologize for that? Like that's, that's the common thing that we feel as men. So um, if you would, just tell everybody here, well, like you know, what possesses you to bring something up in the first place? I would say it would be because you don't feel like, I don't feel like there would be resolution, like, or a sense of closure to that matter. So maybe you would have, you would have apologized for something, but if, if it wasn't like just the right apology <laughs> or the right way, or I felt like, you know, I, I, I'd accepted it and, and there was like a sense of closure or, or um, reconciliation for that specific item. Okay. Similar to how you talk about a checkbook needs to be reconciled yeah. before you can go on. Yeah, I'll talk about that in a minute for these guys' <laughs> benefit. You, um, you said something that made me really curious. You said the right way. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure every guy here is like, yeah, exactly, right? Like, what does that mean? How do you determine as a woman if my apology has met the quality <laughs> threshold for like being closure worthy? I guess, it, it, I mean, this will sound really lame, but for me, it's a feeling <laughs> like it's a, there's like a sense of I'm, I'm feeling from you that you really, I don't know, you mean what you say, you're, there's like a true sense of remorse or I don't know, there's, it's a feeling. Like, okay. Yeah, how else, how else was it? Okay, no, that's fine. <laughs> it's a feeling that's really concrete and actionable for us as men. Um, <laughs> How important is it, because this is the thing that frustrated me the most during our conflict stage of marriage, and I think frustrates most men, 
is we feel like the only way you'll accept an apology as women is if we agree with like your perspective. And this is incredibly challenging as a man because it feels inauthentic and disingenuous to accept the perspective that's not ours. And so maybe if you could, you know, speak to how important is it to feel like we, we have the same perspective as you? Is that, is that part of the feeling? Do you know what I mean? I would say probably in younger days, yes. And I think maybe that's the struggle with people when they get married young. Yeah. And you're still trying to figure yourself out and figure life out. And, um, and unfortunately, then maybe, you know, you don't, give, you don't give each other enough time to work through that you know, so that you get to the other side and be able to enjoy, I feel like what we're enjoying now, which is right. like the, the length of time to be together and, and to like know each other well and, and to have experienced those rough things. And once you figured out it was perfect, it kind of all got better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <that's exciting>. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my, my point in saying that though, is I think when you're young, you think that you can't agree with anybody if they have a different oh, perspective right. yep. from you I, I, i'm only thinking that because i as i've gotten older <laughs> and i'm not going to say my age but i'm old now yeah, um you're real and you're I'm, real older yeah i'm looking at, citizen there. at young people and i'm thinking a lot of the trouble is like you, you there's conflict always because you think you have to agree rather than saying well, we can still be in a relationship, even if we're not agreeing. We don't have yeah, the so. exact perspective. Like you used to say, and it ticked me off when you said this, then <laughs> really I badly. I ticked you off. Really badly. But it's so true now, which is that if we're both the same, like if we both have the same exact perspective or we're exactly the same, then one of us is unnecessary. Mm -hmm. Isn't that profound? <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, we're not going to have the same perspective, but we can still um accept i think that's what the issue is, is like acceptance like okay accept each other's perspective so even though it's different most of the people that are probably joining i mean i, I don't know everybody on the call but uh, the average person that we are generally communicating with in this kind of environment is probably between 35 and 55 been married for a dozen or so years or more and so they're not newlyweds. This is not people that have probably been married three to four years. And if you guys want to put your, you know, the, the your average marriage length in there, that'd be fine in the chat. But these are folks that are middle-aged oftentimes. And, you know, they're really trying to figure out this perspective. Um, what would you want me to do? Because I'm going to raise this because I have clients that ask me this question. What if you were like dogged, like you need to sign this confession in blood that my perspective is right, what would you, looking back, what would you want me to do as a man? Because this is a really hard thing for men. Um, not only do they feel like their partner wants them to have their perspective, which is a natural thing that gets worked out in this stage of marriage because the stage of marriage is all about finding acceptance because you don't begin this stage with marriage uh, of marriage with acceptance you actually have all these expectations for other people for the other person and a lot of the disillusionment in the disillusionment stage is because your spouse has not met your expectations and you're having a hard time accepting one another for this reason so realizing that, I know there's a lot of context here, realizing the background is you're already struggling to accept one another in this stage of marriage. Yeah. Um, I would like to know, would you have wanted me to just cop out and say, yes, you're right? Like, would that have actually given you the closure that you needed just to admit to your story and just bury my perspective? Um, is that... Is that actually helpful, even if you told me that's what you wanted? I would say maybe, <laughs> <laughs> okay. to be honest, like in some circumstances, if there was like an act, like a real thing where I knew like that my, like I was the right in that, in that instance, like, can you just admit it? Like, can you just say, okay, you're right. And then we can move on. And then there'd be times where, where you're right. And then could I just admit it? And then we can move on. And then, yeah, if there's times where 
clearly, I don't want you to acquiesce on something that's like, like, uh, you know that book that you have, the Hold On To Your Nuts book? So like, there's things that are like, what are the- What do you know book? about that book is what I, I want to know. <laughs> I haven't read it, but I mean, I've just, from overhearing you guys talk about All right. it, yeah. it seems like the no, nuts are yeah. like things that you're not going to give up on. Yeah, a nut in that book is a non-negotiable, unalterable truth. Okay. Right. So I wouldn't want you to acquiesce on something that you okay. thought that because then interesting. Yeah. Because then, right, you're you're being disingenuous to yourself. Okay. And you're going, yeah. you're not um, how would you say that's like I would say you don't you're have not integrity. making a stand. Yeah. yeah, you're not you're not you're not showing integrity. So even if I don't agree with it, I'd rather you at least walk in integrity. Okay, that's really like, here's an example that's just like just a lighthearted example, which would be about animals. Okay. Right? Like we have animals. For those of you who don't know, we have animals. Farm, farm animals. Like, <laughs> farm animals. Yeah. And um, I don't like animals. So I can't remember. We had we had chick, we had laying like laying chickens for eggs in our old house. I can't remember if I ever actually had to do anything with them. Mm, um, maybe once. But here, when we first moved here, there was an instance where I was home alone and I had just our two youngest children, and I had to go take care of the of the meat birds and I oh, like I just hated it like I hated every moment it was only a day or maybe two days and I hated every moment of it and so then I I and we weren't getting along really at that time either but I just in my spirit said this is one thing I am not going to acquiesce on because it was your nut. <laughs> yeah, your, nut. Had, your anti-chicken nut. I okay. had um I had acquiesced on a lot of things throughout the years, which I'm, you could probably say you did too, but then you, you get to a point where you're like, you're not going to acquiesce on something on whatever, yeah. you know, and for me, it's animals. Like I'm not going to take care of animals. I'm not <laughs> going to go into a, a chicken enclosure or a goat enclosure and feed them or milk them or collect the eggs or do anything. And so just put when I, just, yeah. <laughs> I just, I don't even know if I told you that. I mean, yeah, you've I've told me that a couple of times. <laughs> I've told lots of other people, like anyone who finds out that we live on a homestead and they ask me, oh, what do you think of the animals? And I say, I buy the feed. Um, That's your line. And I schedule for the pet sitter to come take care of the animals. And I'm not here often alone. Practically never. But there was one instance last year where I had a moment to be here for one or two nights. <laughs> and I hired the pet sitter to come. Yeah feed the animal so my point is I would hope that you would see in me like okay that's a non-negotiable and respect okay, it and yeah. even like admire me for having that like take a stand <laughs> that I would want to do the same for you and I feel like I have you know it's been up and down sure but sure well that's a process that we've gotten to over 30 yeah, years yeah, right? yeah. I don't know that, has that even answered the question I think so to? I mean I really I think what it is is about what do you what do you want when there's conflict, right? I mean, a, a man- I want resolutions so okay. to be happy and loving and have lots of okay. kisses. <laughs> oh, so you're actually, you're headed to affection. So oh, let's talk about that. So from your perspective and like how, how well I address what you're bringing up has everything to do with connection and intimacy. Definitely. Okay, so, so if I am really resistant to what you're bringing up, even if it's a loony, if it, if it, from my perspective, it feels kind of ridiculous that you're bringing this up. Um, emotionally, you're gonna have a hard time feeling any kind of desire or connectedness if I'm just like, I don't wanna hear it kind of thing. Yes, which I mean, over the years, I would, I, I would just say to myself, well, he's still my husband and I love him, <laughs> you know, and, and try not to be that cold, like back away person all of the time, but I'm sure I was, you know, a lot of the times yeah. because it is hard. Like you don't, if you feel like you have this between you, they're not going to be like, oh, lovey dovey. That's true. Um, so what? What do you think, you said you would need to feel closure. Like, can you think of any, I mean, you mentioned you need to feel closure. 
and maybe this is asking a lot for a woman to actually unpack this as far as the way you all think, but are there ingredients for you of what provides closure? Because as a man, I don't need to tell you this, what to fix things, right? And so if a woman comes up and says, hey, I have this offense, um, then I mean, my mind goes into immediately, like, how do we solve that? But that clearly doesn't yeah. work for you. So yeah. what are the magic ingredients? And you actually told a story before, before we joined the call um, about you know, talking at a table that maybe we could tell, tell guys the, what you need. A lot of times when you are bringing something up. Oh yeah, so the other night, I was just using this as an example of like, is this what you mean about this call? Because you know, <laughs> like this is unscripted. So it's not like yeah. we've sat down and said, oh, he's gonna, I'm gonna say this and now you're gonna say that. But I wanted to like have a little bit of idea in my head about what the call is about. So I said, is it like this? So the other night I was at the end of the day and I was feeling completely stressed out, like like stress in my body. Like, and I can't stand feeling stress in my body. Like I wanna feel a peace. I wanna feel like my shoulders can go down and I'm breathing properly and um, my mind and heart are at peace. Yeah, you know I mean, does that make sense to you? So I wasn't feeling that. And um, we, were, we were sitting at dinner and he asked me what was wrong or something. And, and I just said, well, I feel like I'm behind in this. And a lot of it's garden related. <laughs> so I need to cut this back. I need to weed this bed and plant these plants. I need to move these plants. And the gypsy moth caterpillars are are eating my roses and this is going on and then in addition to that I've You're got, overwhelmed I've got like laundry to do and, and meals to make and and I still have some like homeschooling things to finish up so I was just getting on and on and on and on and I feel like at some point in our life we would have wanted to like give me a game plan of how to fix it yeah or mo like, most of our life <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah what you need is yeah. <laughs> but you didn't you really you were, I forget exactly you said it but it was something like um, oh, I know you kind of made, you made, you made light of it or uh, kind of like brought a little levity into it by saying, comparing me to our teenage daughter who does really have a lot of expectations for herself. And if she doesn't complete her entire to-do list of school in one day, like the next day will be like, ah, I'm so behind. So he just, you know, gently and, and lightheartedly compared me to her, which then made she and I both laugh which then kind of helped me. Of course, laughter is good for the body. <laughs> but what I was saying to him before we got on was then the next day, and I didn't say, say this before, the next day, I didn't even share this, but the next day I felt so much better. And I remember then going through my morning, just thinking, wow, it just really helped just to say all of that, like just to get it off of my chest and, and to not have, um, not have you like, give me a game plan because that wouldn't have helped. Like if you had said, well, why don't you, you know, instead of drinking your tea tomorrow morning, the first thing you do, get up and go move that plant that you want to have moved or something like that. That would not have helped me because, you know, I still need to work through my day the way that I need to work through my day and kind of just work things out the way that I need to work them out. But just saying it and having you listen. Well, and I would say- how do you listen. You weren't really having a logistics moment i think you're having an overwhelming emotional moment and yeah. i think for one thing i've learned in 30 years is you don't fix other people's emotions you can fix their logistics but when you're coming to me in that state what i'd always thought was a logistics complaint or a facts complaint was actually just an emotional like i have that feeling i have in my body that you described but I didn't, I didn't know all that. I had no idea that there was like this whole emotional angle of the way that, a, that a, a woman for sure might be feeling but a human and that you're just looking to like, we, we like to say kind of even vomit that out. And that sometimes my job is to hold the bucket, right? And, but most of my, most of our relationship, I actually felt like the bucket, right? And I would take so much things I would take everything personally yeah. that I would be like analyzing and critiquing. And I know it's a disgusting metaphor, but you know, the vomit coming out into the bucket. And then I would get, you know, I was no good at that. 
But the other thing is, you know, what, what you're talking about, I would call catastrophizing. Men, men do this too. We catastrophize, right? Catastrophe, catastrophe, catastrophe. You know, I know in my own, by my own admission, most of our marriage, I would have actually told you why that was invalid. I didn't, I wouldn't have said that it was invalid, but I communicated with you like, well, there's no reason to think that way. And you know, my family does this a lot. So yeah. like, there's this constant, like, oh, you don't need to worry about that. That's silly, right? Um, kind of a, not a mean critique, but critiquing the person for having that experience. Mm -hmm. So maybe if we could talk a little bit about how that feels or felt like, because we talked about, yeah, you just want to get it out and it's logistics, but I know from our past, it was hurtful to have that kind of invalidating going on. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, maybe if you have anything to share about. Well, it definitely would just be like, a, and I talked about it, maybe you were here last time. <laughs> I talked about the idea of like, just throw your hands up because you don't know what to do. It's like that, it was that kind of feeling of just like, well, you know, if this is, this is like where I'm coming from, but nothing that I'm saying is being heard or accepted or okay. whatever, then it's just like throw your hands up and grin and bear it and move on. So for um, you, okay. for you is validating me validating the facts of your story and what you're saying or validating the emotional experience you're having? Probably mostly the emotional experience, but I mean, in the last couple of years that we've, you know, our relationship has improved. The thing that I've appreciated the most is like when I have these moments or, or a complaint or even like I'm going on and on about, you know, something in life that I'm just complaining about. Instead of like what you used to do, you just go something like. I used to be really judgy about that. For sure. Yeah, I know that. Oh, yeah. I, <laughs> God forbid I like said anything negative about someone's house or something. Yeah. You'd be like, well, that's home to someone. <laughs> yeah, I, like, always, I always had like a, <laughs> I always had some sort of like, um, yeah, I shared my perspective, right? Which may have been a high regard uh, perspective, yeah. but it was a low regard perspective for you. Yeah, high regard for other people. I mean, there's valid, like, it's a valid point of view, like, you but don't want to be completely missing completely houses. missing the point that's like saying that's like if we were driving down the road and you say i judge them i'm like i don't right yeah. like that's actually missing that you're just sharing something yeah. that's your perspective and i call that now in my work with these guys perspective dominance meaning every time you shared your perspective i would feel like i needed to share mine yeah and i needed it to be more superior yeah I don't need to tell you that. Yes. Yeah. yeah your, the look in your face is pretty confirming that way. Um, okay. So anything else to say about that? Otherwise I'm going to, I'm going to ask Charlie to unmute himself. And I have a book that I recommend based on what like, I thought of it as you were talking that there's a book that um, a, a couple of years ago, he had had a retreat with some, some guys, you know, and they were, I was just around the campfire listening to some talk. And then I, then I was like looking at my Kindle and Mark, we share a Kindle account. So you, you had like Which is books. dangerous when you're in men's work, yeah. by the way. <laughs> yeah. Open her. Yeah, some of the book cuts. Semen retention like, books. Yeah, okay. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I forget why. Based on something that was talked about and I was looking, looking on my Kindle for the book that I was reading, like my book, I came across this book called um, I Hear You. I knew you were going to say that. And... And I read it and they can, you can read it in like a day or two. It's, it's not very, it's, it's like a quarter inch thing. Yeah. I recommend but this book all the time. Boy, that book, I feel like if we had read that book and like actually taken it to heart. <sighs> yeah. That's the kiss. That's the key. Could you, could I have taken it to heart at an earlier time? And, in life? But it's so like, it's so good for everybody because even, I mean, I even felt like I was rebuked in my spirit from that book from like, as a mother, you know, like, if our kids would complain, I would do the same thing that you were doing yeah. to me, probably to them, not realizing. Invalidating. Here's why. Saying, here's why you, you should have that. a bad attitude. You should be happy. I just, I actually just did this the other day. One of our daughters was grumpy. Now that I'm thinking about it, I did this the other day, and you didn't stop. <laughs> well, I don't stop you when I see it because I spent my whole life judging you and being your 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 behavior police. 
Okay, this is literally like I'm just thinking about this right now. But our daughter, one of our young, our youngest, was really grumpy the other night, and she was mad at me for something. I forget what. I think she had come to talk to me, and I was busy, and I said not now or something. Anyway, I found out at the dinner table that she was grumpy, and I was like, "Well, aren't I glad I just took you to Starbucks and got you a nice <laughs> drink, and yeah. went out thrifting and got you some cool clothes? And what a bad mom!" <laughs> Of course, as I'm saying it, I'm starting to see like, you know, completely ridiculous. And I think you did make some kind of remark, which again brought levity. I tried, yeah, because I would have, like I would have hardcore judged you for you hurting the kids when our when it was our older kid. When I yeah. did that to the older kids, he would have been like. Yeah. One yeah. of the things I've learned <laughs> parenting six kids is, first of all, kids are very resilient. Uh, it always pains me when we have in any way harmed our kids. But one of the things I've learned in my own life as a kid of a parent, but also having six is it's those things that actually help them in a roundabout way, that adversity and challenge um, in some in some way actually helps. Like seeing your parents aren't perfect and that they mess up like that. I feel like it's helped us more as parents, by the way, to be resilient in recovering from that and apologizing for our, you know, our wrong way with them than it would have been to just be perfect yeah. because we're not perfect, meaning in our, in the way we do things. And I think actually your kids see and you mess up and what do you do when you mess up? Yeah. But what I was going to, my point in all that is that the book, I feel like, and I recommend you read it if you haven't read it, is it helps you in all aspects. If, if you remember it, you know, <laughs> obviously yeah. I wasn't remembering it the other night, but I remember after I read it, I then was talking to like all of our older kids about it. And then I was really um, like trying to put his, his, his ideas into action. And then I'd be like, even like with my, my teenage daughter, who's like the most like me, I would be like, did you notice what I did there? Well, you guys even brought it I up listened. one time. I listened yeah. to you. <laughs> well, I called you out on that one time because I was talking to you and you were employing tactics from that book. And I'm like, have you been in my Kindle account? <laughs> And you had said, yeah, I read that. And then our daughter ch chimed in. She's like, yeah, dad, you have been doing that. <laughs> so I thought it was pretty funny. All right. Just being sensitive to time, um, I want to give Charlie an opportunity to throw out a, a question or two. And um, don't worry if we don't get to your question. I'll explain something at the end of this call where you'll still have the opportunity. But Charlie, what, what's yeah, that? So C, C asks, uh, would you feel heard if the man suggests help? with maybe taking care of some of the chores, laundry dishes, to take take some of your to-do list. Mm, yeah, that's one that come, has come up a lot for us. Would I feel hurt if he asked? Her, heard or hurt? Or heard. Hurt. Heard. Yeah, heard. well, you feel heard. So, so essentially the question, I think the context was that um, uh, Zelda was saying that she just wants to be able to express herself and to be heard without uh, spin you uh fixing it right yeah, and so, so yeah so would then offering to, to do some chores or some laundry or some dishes to take something off your to-do list would that equate to being heard or would that be uh, another form of fixing it yeah I, I have perspective about that i'll share after you do i would say it depends on the on the, <laughs> on the chore if if like the next night he offered it to like get take out or go out to dinner or something I would feel like that was heard and he was just wanting to help in a good way. But if he wants to like um, do the laundry or. Um, if I'm trying to keep you from having homes, emotions. Yeah, home, like a homeschool job or a specific garden job that is like me and he would offer to do that, then I would feel like, that, yeah, that wouldn't have been heard. Because you, you were like trying to fix the emotions instead of just hearing them. Yeah. So looking back over 30 years, let me encapsulate a few things I've learned. One, I used to just jump into oftentimes, not perfectly, like, oh, I'll do those things. And there's a few reasons I did that. The number one thing I was doing was doing it so that she, she, I could avoid her having those kinds of moments because I had conceptualized or lived as though when a woman is doing that, that's bad and should be avoided at all costs. But that's hurtful way to think about women, meaning like if you believe that your woman's emotions are something to be avoided, 
And so you do to do and honey do lists to try to keep her from ever having any kind of high range emotionally, then you're actually rejecting that, that part of her and she'll feel, and I think she did feel not safe to, to have those moments because she, she would feel judged because I would do everything to try to avoid that. The other reason, and this is what, you know, Dr. Glover talks about is it other times I would just jump into like doing mode, hoping that if I do, it'll earn me cred, right? Like uh, credibility, more time. That was a big one. I used to try to do a lot of stuff. So she'd have no reason to say, well, I have something to do because I, I in that season of life, I felt really like, um, like I was getting the crumbs, you know, and, and she thought I hated reading. I hated her Kindle because like that was, that was kind of like the end of the day, the kids would go to sleep and she'd get her Kindle, she'd fall asleep. And I'd be like, WTF, where's my affection, man. Right. So, um, I would try to, when I felt like that, I'd try to jump in and do all this honeydew stuff that I would hear her complain about so that I would just like wipe that off the to-do. Like, hey, that gives her more time for me, right? Um, I know that was a bad, that was a bad motivation for sure. Um, now, what I try to do as a result of that book is just ask, is there anything that you need from me? So that way, if it's a thing where she would like me to do something to strategize and help, because that is a gift of the masculine is being able to jump in and help contribute, um, offload, right? And I'm quite happy to do it, but now I give her the opportunity to tell me if that's what she wants so that I respect if she's just vomiting in a bucket. It's like, no, I just want you to hold the bucket. Um, and I don't do that perfectly. This is just what I endeavor to do. And, um, and then sometimes, sometimes I will have a sense of, okay, I don't need to ask her permission for this. It would just be an act of love. And so I have to kind of internally check, am I expressing love for this person by doing this? And that might be when I just arrange something, you know, to like, uh, to be less difficult, but uh, that takes a lot of, I really have to check with myself and make sure my motivations are not solving my discomfort, but an attempt to help her feel less. Are you gonna say something else? All right, Charlie, let's do one, one more for now. Okay, so, so Jamie asks, so heard in quotes means empathizing how hard it must be to feel like you're alone in your opinion without a husband agreeing? Is that hmm. the, is that what you're saying? Well, can you say that, that I think that, that question, I think that question was uh, uh, pointed at Zelda. So Jamie asks, so heard means empathizing how hard it must be to feel like you're alone in your opinion without a husband agreeing. And it's stated as a question. Yeah. At times. So. Yeah, at times. I mean, do I, do I feel like he needs to agree all of the time? No, but heard is definitely the empathizing. Definitely empathizing. I'm going to share my screen for a minute because I think I have something that will help with this. Um, I want you guys to see this image and think about it for a minute. And I won't ask you to answer the question just because of being muted. Um, if you, everybody just, somebody, Charlie, wave, wave your hand if you could see that. You see that? Okay. These are actually um, four pictures of the exact same thing. Okay, and, and so they're all actually perspectives of a pyramid. So the one on the far left is top down. The, one, the second one in is the side perspective. The third one is the corner perspective. And the fourth one is the bottom perspective. And they're all valid perspectives of a pyramid. And so one of the things I've learned that's been greatly, greatly helpful to me in life is that I could see the one on the far left and Zelda might see the one on the far right and she's not wrong and I'm not wrong. And so heard to me means validating that the perspective she has is a valid perspective, but doing so without having to have that be my perspective. Right, so it's just understanding that people can have multiple perspectives of the same experience, and nobody has to be right 
and wrong. In fact, um, it was that I needed to be right a lot, and I'll talk about that in the next one, that made some of this really difficult. But anyway, how does that sound to you about the herd thing? Um, I love that example. I wish I had seen that before. I would, I would, I mean, I would teach that to our children. Okay, I'll share it. I'll share it. That's like, that's beautiful. I think that's, a, not to keep going back to our society, but I feel like that's the problem with our society is like people don't want it just realize that we all have different perspectives but definitely in marriage like you know it's you're not viewing you're not viewing it my way so it must be the wrong way but yeah, yeah well, when you look at that i would i feel like every married person should print that out <laughs> and put it on their bathroom mirror probably a good idea we'll sell we'll, we'll make a, a brand <laughs> new t-shirt <laughs> um all right so let me move into the next <laughs> section and we'll see if questions get answered along the way and if not we'll have some time at the end hopefully so the other thing I want to talk about was three ineffective things that men do. And you can add as much color here as you want, but also you can add in things I haven't talked about. Um, but three things that I recognize in my story with you that I did that were completely ineffective for moving through these experiences where you were bringing up emotions of the past. Um, I remember many of them were in the hot tub. Remember, we'd have like some really long arguments in the hot tub. Yeah, I try to forget them. I know. So I tell people when I tell stories, like I kind of, you, it seemed like they'd be hours and I kind of just wanted to sink underwater and never come up again. I was so flabbergasted. And that was a time I would say was perspective dominance, meaning you kept sharing your perspective with me about some things and I kept sharing mine with you. And you were like, no, it's a, it's a pyramid. And I was like, no, it's a square. No, it's a pyramid. No, it's a square, right? And so the number one thing I think men do when women are sharing their perspective of the past is that we argue, defend, and explain. Um, and I am particularly good at this, meaning I can argue very well. <laughs> um, and I know that that caused you a, a, a huge level of hurt because when we were when you were trying to share this perspective it wasn't just that no I have a different perspective it's your perspective is wrong it was like this and so I spent so much time arguing that I know I wasn't I was definitely not able to hold that bucket right um and so then if you know with the, the vomiting metaphor it's like well that's almost like saying hold your own damn bucket um I feel like that was hurtful. And then every time I heard you tell your perspective, hey, it's a square, I would defend my perspective as though you saying it was a square was an assault on me saying it was a pyramid, right? Mm -hmm. And again, this goes back to taking things really personally. Um, and so every time you didn't, you didn't like agree, oh, you have the right perspective, I was like, well, clearly this woman needs more detail. So I would, <laughs> I would explain and like ad nauseum. I was like more details. I would try to answer every objection or, or thing that you said to tell you why you were wrong to think that. And um, yeah, that whole thing just got me nowhere. We did that for what do you think the first 20, 20 plus years of marriage? Around in circles. Yeah, it was, it was so damn exhausting. It was the kind of thing where when those kinds of things happened, uh, and I mentioned this, if you, if you heard me say this before, the idea of the fight or flight, like that, it was like those times where I literally just wanted to get in the car and drive away yeah. because there's nothing I could do. Yeah. Well, anything else you want to explain about how that felt? Like, did you feel like I loved you and valued you no. in that moment? It was during those times that I would literally doubt and say to myself, my like my inner my inner monologue would be, why did he ask me to marry him? <laughs> like uh. he doesn't know me, he doesn't love me, he doesn't even seem to like me, he doesn't like. Uh, even though I never said anything. that, let's talk about this. <laughs> yeah, because I never said it. Never I said never it. said any of that stuff. No, but I felt it. So and he actually, 
to his credit, got down in the snow the night he asked me to marry him. So there must, like I would say to myself, there must have been something there if he knelt in the snow to ask me to marry so him. But you questioned I just, everything. I questioned everything. Yeah, I questioned it all. Okay. And so you didn't feel, you clearly didn't feel valued. No. And it wasn't because I had a different perspective. It was because I wouldn't actually appreciate yours and I would invalidate your perspective yeah. or refuse to see it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so what did that do to your, you know, your desire to be close, connected, or feeling connected, intimate, any of that stuff? Like, how it didn't feel good. I literally, I would, I don't know if I, I feel like I might have shared the, this analogy with you at some point in like one more attempt to try to like break through what I felt like was this wall of, I can't break through, of this idea of like two ships because I would lay in bed. You did say this. Yeah. Oh, I did share it. Okay. So I would lay in bed. And actually, our bed is like this. I'm here and he's there. And I would feel this wall here. And I would literally like just picture like two ships. This might sound completely ridiculous. <laughs> <It's too laughs> okay. I would picture like two ships going down the sea side by side, but never interacting, like never communicating, never doing anything together. Like they're not, they're in the same fleet, but they're not really in the same fleet. You know what I mean? I don't yeah. know if that makes sense, but yeah. that's how I pictured us. And it would usually be at night when I'm laying in bed, right before I go to sleep, or in the morning, right before I wake up. It's a big turn on, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, I think actually what you're describing is characteristic of the disillusionment stage because you don't have the acceptance, which is the basis for intimacy, right? If I don't accept you, are you going to feel like connected? Well, and then this is the thing I would come back to is if you're not going to accept me, who in the world, I might start crying about this. I feel tears coming right now. Who in the world is going to accept me, right? Like if it's not my spouse, yeah. then, then I'm supposed to, in my opinion, I'm literally going to start crying. <laughs> like, get unconditional love and acceptance from. Yeah. Then yeah. who is it from? Because, I mean, not to be like getting too much into my story, but I wasn't. I didn't get that from my own parents. So like, yeah. if you're not getting unconditional love from your own parents and, you know, your friends are like in and out, you know, I made decisions about life based on friends, but then where are they? Who knows? You know, they're in and out. If it's not your spouse, where you're getting unconditional yeah, where love you get and it? acceptance, where are, you get? where are you going to get that? That's what I kept coming back to in my mind. Right. And the interesting thing about unconditional acceptance is the only way you get there is to have things that you, that require it right? Like you spend so much time in marriage frustrated that you're finding things you need to accept, but that's the basis of unconditional acceptance. And I personally believe, and in our story, that that is the basis for better intimacy. And I don't mean just sex. I mean like everything in a human relationship love-wise is better when you know that person has really pissed me off or I've pissed them off and they still love me the same, Yeah. right? Like that's the fourth stage of marriage, by the way, which is after the disillusionment stage. And you only get there if you're willing to accept when you have been really hurt. Like we both really hurt each other. And that, as much as that sucked, actually becomes a beautiful thing because we've been willing to look at it and to go and let it come up not try to just move on past it and keep talking about it because every time you shave those sharp edges off that hurt, you actually are building your own intimacy later in life. Meaning that you're like, Hey, well, we got through that. We loved each other more deeply to do that. And that's actually the story because, you know, every man, uh, you could chime in a minute if women are like this, but I think every man daydreams about this. It's actually not about sex although we're, we're talked about like that's all we care about, right? But sex for most men, and definitely I think the men on the phone, on the call, you can, you can give us a, a reaction if I'm right here. What you really want is a deep emotional connection with the woman. And, it, and sex is just one way that's expressed, right? But there's, this, there's a depth to the connection that a man daydreams about with a woman so from the time he's little, right? And... What I didn't realize 
all my life until after we were out of that stage was, ah, it's actually the, the power struggle stage was the thing that produced the acceptance that produces that level of connection. Meaning like you can't have that level of connection with another human being without actually really hurting each other and forgiving and moving on and reconciling because that's the basis of intimacy. The basis of intimacy is will you love me even though you see everything that sucks about me and, and choose me, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> um, if I, I don't know, I don't know that single person. <laughs> sure you are. If somebody had told me that at 20, because we yeah. got married, I was, I was 20 and you were 22, 22. right? So, it would have made all the difference because I spent so much time trying to avoid the very things that become the, you know, that are the soil for growing the intimacy that I've, I'd, I'd always wanted. And like a lot of guys probably with us, I thought, well, oh, well, I'm having so much conflict with this woman. I'm never going to have that kind of relationship I want with her. Maybe someone else out in the world would work, right? And, and you men get this pressure and women get it too. I need to like decide what I'm going to do because time is running out to find the person I can have that connection with, not realizing the person that you're at odds with right now is very likely the person. And it's the conflict that you have that when you overcome leads to that intimacy. So right. I wish, I really wish I had known that earlier, although there's no consequence to that. That's the other thing. As much as I say that, it was all necessary. I, I wouldn't yeah. change any moment of it. Actually. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I agree. And I would just say that to speak to that idea of like, I should just move on because time is running out. If you haven't gotten, you know, if you haven't gotten through what stage you say that's called? So, well, disillusionment, let's go. The disillusionment stage, which means you're not, you haven't learned something yet in yourself, right? Well, you're just going to be taking yourself yeah. into that next relationship. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of people do. A lot of people don't have an option sometimes, yeah. especially a lot of the guys with us. They're not the ones that want the relationship to end. Right. So um, It's actually the, the wife oftentimes who is in that spot of saying, I, I can't see this working. And so she leaves. That's a whole other topic. I would say if that's you, helped a lot of people overcome that. Um, and these things are still very relevant because... You can still accept a person who says they don't want to be with you. And that acceptance of their perspective right now, even if it's, I can't be around you, is itself very healing and helpful. And then I would just, speak, if I just speak to the yeah. time thing, which I just feel like is something that I'm kind of learning just in the last week about, um, which I just feel like what I just have been learning has to do with gardening, but in my mind, it kind of goes with what you're saying with time, that time is running out. And what I feel like I've learned in the last week with gardening, based on that, that kind of meltdown I had at the beginning of the week was like, I've got to do this and I've got to do that. And this is the, and that's that whole idea of like time, like mm -hmm. time is running out. And in the last couple of days, I've just had this renewed perspective of, you know, why? Like, what's the rush? You know, um, why does why does there have to be a time frame on this? And I feel like, um, you know, that the lessons we learn from gardening apply to life. Like, oh yeah, they, why did why these guys there, know I talk about gardening all the time? Uh, like, why does there have to be a time frame? And I think also I've been thinking about it in relation to one of our one of our children, um, who I used the word behind a lot when when they were going through school, and it was like in their second their second or third year of high school, I finally said to them, you're not behind, like whatever you do, you know, is fine or however long it takes, it's fine. And so that thought has been coming back to me too. So I would just say this idea of like time, why do we all, we all do this in all aspects of our life in whether it's gardening or as a hobby or, yeah. or our work, or I mean, I know there's a lot of work, but our children, our relationships, so there has to be this, this time I think you're, rather than just like taking it moment by moment I or, not to get too deep here I actually talk a lot about that in my renewed masculine man course oh, really? yeah that your your brain and body are very time oriented because it's an expiration date on on both right your ego yeah. but your heart I personally I know you put the same as is immortal so mm -hmm. I don't think your heart cares the same way about time 
that your ego does. And if you're all up in your head, catastrophizing about everything, it's not going to go well. And uh, to me, that's where the behind feeling comes from. You know, I think the other thing that makes me think about the time was I was reading an article yesterday about the queen, Queen Elizabeth. Uh, and I compare a lot of things to the queen in my life. <laughs> really? Yeah. I know you liked reading about her. I didn't know like, you compared a lot of your life. Well, I mean, like, I don't compare like my life. I'm just saying, like, I'll say to the, ch my, to the children and to the girls, especially, like, would the queen of England do that? Hmm. Or, um, so I was reading this article about her yesterday, and then it's her, her 70th, it's her platinum jubilee, so 70 years of being monarch. And just... Like that time, you know, that she's gone through as monarch. And was she so worried, like, about time running out? Or was she just like taking it a day at a time, moment by moment, and, you know, event by event? And she, and um, I, the quote, they quoted her as saying, like, because she had she's seen a lot of catastrophes, which I think could be related to marriage. <laughs> but I forget, I wish I remembered the quote, but it was something like, you know, like they'll be, we'll get through it in the end. Like there'll be, there'll be restoration on the other side of this. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know if any of that made sense. That's okay. that's okay. That's okay. It's in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> it really did You're wrong. Not. You're wrong. It sucks. Your perspective is wrong. All right. I am going to move on to okay. the next ineffective thing um, because this one I think is a, is one that really needs to be talked about uh, with men one of the most ineffective things I had ever tried to do whenever I did this was insist on moving forward and basically, you know, kind of put my foot down. I'm not talking about this again. I'm done talking about this. I've already apologized and boom, right? Like, that's it. We're not talking about it anymore. Stop bringing it up, right? Um, you know, for the guys watching, I, I spent 20 some odd years as a software engineer and architect. And I built software, co very complex uh, corporate software for large enterprises. And inevitably, what would happen is the stakeholders, that means the people that are kind of the sponsors of the project, they would poorly define what they want. That we would get into a project, they would, it would be poorly managed, they'd have very little specifications of what they wanted built. It wouldn't be going well. And I would say, well, it's this and this and this. Okay, here's my litany of issues. I would love to build you this, but you're not clear about what you want. Answer this question. And a lot of corporate response, and, and Charlie, you might get a kick out of this, maybe you've heard this before. Some executive would come into the meeting and be like, hey, we're just moving forward. And I would laugh. I was like, you can say you want to move forward all you want. I can't actually build you what you want just because you said we're moving forward. I can't build you what I what you want until you answer some damn questions, right? And Zelda is probably laughing because I would, I would bitch about this at the dinner table a lot, like how frustrating it was to move forward in reality with people who admittedly said they wanted to move forward, but they actually wouldn't do the work to allow us to move forward. And I didn't know at the time when I was complaining like that, that I had the same idea about relationships. Like, I'm just going to demand, like, oh, we're not looking at this anymore. Where to her, there was like un unanswered questions. Like, there's details. There wasn't closure to something, right? And I use an uh, the analogy, I think maybe with you, about, you know, imagine somebody owes you $30,000. And... You're trying to, you're like, hey man, you owe me $30,000. And they're like, you know what? We're just moving on. We're just, that was yesterday. Today's a new day, right? And, and they just move forward. And relationships, and you mentioned this earlier, I, I, uh, I believe relationships have like a ledger of sorts. I don't mean that they're transactional. I just mean, like, if I hurt you, that goes in the ledger, right? Um, even if I, if I don't know what's been done, you carry it around in a ledger of sorts. And, and I have my own ledger for like, okay, you said that, that's stone, right? And I think forgiveness is an agreement not to hold the ledger against each other, but I believe reconciliation, just like balancing your checkbook means you still need to actually look at that ledger 
and zero it out, right? Meaning, you know, it bugs you to like nobody's business if we ever write a check to somebody and they don't cash it because you can't, like yeah. you can't stand that it makes our bank records messed up. And to me, somebody saying we're, we're just moving on with this stuff on the ledger is like the same. Like I, I wanna move on, but I really need it, these records to be clean. Yeah. So maybe you could just spend, you know, like two minutes talking about how it feels when I, or how it's ever felt, and it doesn't have to be me, this could be any man in your life, anybody in your life yeah, who just yeah. says, well, you know, we're moving, we're moving forward. Yeah, it feels hurtful, and it feels anger provoking, <laughs> and it feels like a root of bitterness could take root in my heart and stay there, because nothing's been done to really um, make it right. Like, I, I still can choose to forgive, you know, forgiveness can still take place, sure. but that's not reconciliation. And in order to move forward, in my opinion, you have to have that reconciliation. And that's where I'm using the word closure okay. synonymously with reconciliation in order to move forward. I mean, I, I can move forward by myself and I can, I can, you know, what's, what's self-soothe and keep going. But um, what would be the impact on trust if, if I did that, or, or anybody in your life who does that, um, even if you decide to forgive, yeah. but you have this <clears throat> stuff on the ledger, what does that do to, the, to your trust in that person and your ability and willingness to, to have closeness and vulnerability and intimacy? And again, this doesn't have to be husband and wife. This is, I think this is pertinent in any relationship. Well, it would be tenuous, like the trust level is tenuous, and there's not a lot of um, weight, you know, like I'm not going to put a lot of weight in that. I, I hate to use this as an example, but it's the one that, like, in my life that stands out the most, Music. because it's, there'll never be reconciliation now, because the person has died. Yeah. So it was my father, my biological father, um, stopped relating to me when I was eight, and then came back into my life when I was 22, a little bit, and then more when I was 28. And then he was faithful from the time I think I was 20, or no, 29 or 30. From 29 or 30, until he got sick and died, he was faithful to, to send a $50 check, or $50, actually he said $50 cash through the mail. And birth, birthday cards. Cash in birthday cards to um, our five biological children. And, um, and I thought that was great, but it didn't, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't speak to my heart. <laughs> like yeah, it there was actually... no real sense of reconciliation because he never really like sought to restore yeah, the you relationship. Had, you had questions that he was unwilling to talk about. Yeah, there was no, there was no restoration. So to me, that's the biggest example in my life yeah. that I can think of. I'll give another example from our bonus son's life, if I may. He, you know, has a biological mother, and then he has an aunt who, who raised him most of his life, and then he has me. And he actually, the night he was telling me this story, he actually said that if people ask him who his mom is, he says me. So that's nice. But um, those two people want to really be loving to him now even though there were there, there are hurts and so he's telling me this on his birthday and I hope that he doesn't mind me sharing this now that I'm in the middle of it it's okay but, nobody, nobody knows <laughs> um they were he was telling me that, that they want to be like lovey lovey and that he was in in a, in a, a room of people with his biological mom and, and she grabbed him and she said this is my son and he wanted he she wanted to introduce him because she's so proud of him because he's growing into to be this wonderful man, you know? And he said, he actually said, you're not mine. I'm not your son, like at that moment. Yes. But I, I said, well, you know, there, it sounds like they're wanting to make amends. And he says, but they're not really, like they're not really wanting to make amends. They're not really going back and apologizing for all of the different hurts. So then that's when I, it made me think of this idea of the checkbook that you brought up. And I, and I shared that with him. And he's like, yeah, that's exactly right. And what it's doing is just making me angry. Mm -hmm. And he said that with like. Yeah, it actually is a new way of hurting. It's like, well, I, I don't feel loved because you won't go here and look at this with me. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a thing I, ne I need to feel differently about. 
and it would really help me if you'd go back and look at this with me because if I maybe if I understood it differently which I don't know if you all read the article did you like did no you I'll actually article? I'll I'll send that I'll mention that at the end of the, the call oh, I didn't I, no I didn't it's no problem I just didn't um I didn't make it part of the description but it's some it's part of what I'll tell people at the end oh. yeah you can, can talk, can about, talk that. about that yeah okay so in the article that you may read after that, if you want it you might want to read um which which she wrote you talk about like our life is building rooms or building which i love that example because you know i would say that too like we're building a life together yeah. we're building this you know this whatever um and so you talked about how a man will just want to keep going on and building more rooms and be working on that room and uh, the wife you know might be opening a door and realizing that something is awry in that in that room like maybe mold is growing or if I would if it were if I were writing the article I would just say it's a mess like <laughs> yeah. everything in the room was out of place or I might have I might have used the example of like tools like you're building fine you're building but your tools are like making a mess over here like that would be my example in life um but I, what I appreciated was was how you said like a wife just wants the husband to just go back and like look at that room and say okay well, what do we need to do here like to clean it up it's like that sense of like what do we need to do to make this right so that we can so then like we can put closure you didn't use the word closure i use yeah. that word on this room so that we can then go on and keep building and focusing which even in real life not to you know be negative but when we have like actual projects you could and say we, this. I was just going to actually reference the same thing. If I don't actually do anything about that, what what do you feel? If we have, we'll have we'll, we'll have actual projects like around our we house. We have a lot of them. A lot of them. Yeah. Where they'll get to a certain point, and they're great, and the work is fantastic. He's very talented. He's done a lot of it himself. But they're we're not done. They're not always. I'm actually going to say I I can't. Okay. You can say anything. I'm not worried about. <laughs> Okay, there's one room that is actually, I can think of that as actually done, but there are a number of projects where they're just not quite done. It's like, like some trim needs to go on. I know you're thinking about. paint needs to happen. <laughs> or, you know, when we, we remodeled a specific project a number of years ago, the tools literally lined the hallway from my bedroom to my dining room for a year. And so to me, that like, and you're, I think you thought like the project was done, but I'm like these tools, and I just found out to say I'm picking these up <laughs> and I'm taking them to the barn and driving them. Yeah. So it was like. Well, that is because, man. <laughs> no, I totally understand this, and actually, these same stories have helped me to understand relationships and that, um, like let's use the hallway and the trim, right? Because we the hallway we built up the hallway where there wasn't one. We had like nice hardwood, hickory floors done. And I still have not trimmed just the hallway base trim. Now, it's because I legitimately <laughs> don't remember that it needs to be done until she mentions it. Because as a man, I tend to be future expanding oriented. And because it's not natural for me to go backwards. It's just not, right? But she's very good at this. And so rather than resent that, I actually see that as a partnership where like, oh, I'm really glad that you care and tend to those things because it does actually make me complete more which is actually a good feeling as a man but um because it's not my strength and that's what you do like the combination of those i think works really well but i used to resent it i used to again i used to take everything personally yes and um sure. and i would see it as critique what i didn't realize at the time was I just had an inner dialogue of critique, so I heard everything through that lens. Right? All right, let me talk about the last thing and the three ineffective things. Then I'll see if Charlie's got a question or two for us. Um, I didn't do this a ton, but I know it's hurt you when I did this, is I would just walk away. I would just like, I would leave when you kept bringing stuff up. I, because I would remember, oh, here we go again. Round around the mulberry bush, I would say, and I would feel exasperated and I would just get in the car or go somewhere and leave, um, which on some level was probably beneficial in that I probably would have exploded in rage had I not. But if you could talk about how it feels to you, if you're trying to bring up something that's from the past or just in the relationship that feels like the trim. 
the unfinished <laughs> thing, the, the non-closure, and I just leave. Yeah. Um, what is the what is the what are your insights feel like when that happens? Um, complete like scared or rejected or like mm. you're never coming back. Um, I. It's a fear. Yeah, fear. I um. I grew up in a in a family not my biological father, obviously, but my mom and my, my new dad. And when they would have big blow ups, um, one, one of them would leave. I, I remember it more, my, my dad, like him just slamming the door so hard. And it was just like a sense of like fear in my heart, they're crying, and, <sighs> fear in my heart and like going into my room and just trying to make things okay. And so thankfully you did not do that much. And I had resolved, as a young adult, young mother, that I was going to not act like my parents acted. And so I made a lot of agreements um, that I didn't do. Like I just stuffed everything. So I didn't do those like blow ups. And I never, I never left and never walked away. But so thankfully you didn't do it that often. But when you did, it was that same kind of feeling like, like being scared and you're never, you're never gonna come back. I'm sorry. Crying. It's okay. I accept it. It's very brave of you. All right, Charlie. Maybe you could give us um the best question, not the best one, but one that feels pertinent. We're all, we're all caught up on questions, but I think it's 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 uh, noteworthy to say that uh, to to illustrate here, right, or to take note of right here that. In general, men communicate facts and women communicate feelings, right? As Zelda's retelling the story, she's actually sort of reliving it and feeling it. Yeah. Whereas when you're kind of telling the story about the hot tub or some some moment in time when the two of you weren't getting along so well, you're able to recount the facts of that moment That's with not, without yeah. necessarily reliving the experience. That is very interesting. Now, there was a time I would have relived it emotionally. Um, at least that story, the hot tub story, for example, it's just part, part of the healing that took place in my own life was, I don't feel pain there anymore. And I, I just feel the wisdom from the scar, right? Um, which is helpful. But um, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't cause me a, a hard emotion anyway to think about those times anymore. I did for a while. <laughs> so let me ask you. Not, it wasn't a healed room for me either. Go ahead. So so let me ask you a question about this moment. So Zelda's um, upset about the thoughts of the past and how that felt and the pain of that. And then you're there in the room with her. Um, how does that, like I, we, we all saw your response and how you said it was okay and all that. So talk a little bit about allowing her to have her feelings. Oh, sure, yeah. I mean, I'm proud as, proud as a peach about her all together. So there was a time in my life I would have been pretty unnerved by anybody seeing her um, and, and really for re reasons having nothing to do with her, but everything to do with me, right? So um, yeah, I just, to me, it's like she's who she is and because the stage of our relationship is based on acceptance there's really anything she could experience, which I'd be okay with, um, because that's the fruit of getting through the disillusionment stage and unconditionally accepting somebody it means like she can have any experience she wants and I don't feel like it needs to be different than that. So I don't feel, I don't feel anything um, emotionally challenging with her crying or being, you know, to relive that in this moment anyway. Um, I know it'll actually make the rest of our day good, to be honest. Meaning just being able to be ourselves in front of, you know, what, 38 of you. <laughs> um, I know there's a, there's a lot of liberty there. Like, so we, we just live that way, I think all the time, meaning like, yeah. I feel, sometimes I feel like a, a little bit of a paternalistic, and I don't mean that in a pejorative way, well, like when she talks about her dad, <clears throat> that was a challenging experience for me because I would have, and I wanted to kind of go give him a shakedown, like, you know, 
grab him by the scruff and like, can you please fix this? And when he was sick, I thought about doing that. And I felt like, and we may even talked about it. I asked, I didn't, I didn't want to overstep my boundaries and try to fix that dad situation, but I knew he was dying. And so that was tough. It's tough as a father and a husband and knowing that like maybe there's something I could do to make this thing better so that it's not permanent. Um, that, that, that's been a little bit of a sting, you know, as a husband to sort of know that that part of our relationship with her, with her biological father, like it just is what it is, you know? Um, and because I do want to fix things as a man and I'm good at fixing things as a man, like I just, there's some part of me that's just like, ah, like it doesn't feel defeated. I just feel like I wish I, I wish I could have done more about that. Um, it just comes back to it's like it's part of my story yeah. and you have things that are part of your story and our marriage our early years that we might look at now and go oh I wish we could have done that better yeah you know now it's a part of our story and we know what do you do you're you just yep you just walk through it I agree all right, let me, um, let me talk about the last thing that we were gonna talk about, and then I'll share with you what you can do next. And if we have a moment left for questions, or if anybody has questions, feel free to put them in the chat for now, and we'll see if we have time to answer them. The last thing I put on the, the kind of call today was why she thinks you never listen. And I didn't add this, but I would add to this now, and always make everything about you. I heard you never listen probably on a monthly basis um, for 20 years. And, I, and I, I used to take great offense at that because not only could I, res I mean, I think I could almost read back to you verbatim what you said and actually from multiple angles. So I was like, clearly I do listen. I can tell you what you just said. Um, and then when you'd say, I'd always make it about me, I'd be like, what the hell is she talking about? Like. I'm not making it about you, I, I hear you, right? So this is an ineffective thing that men do. We hear the words, and a lot of you guys, especially if you work with me, or if you're, you know, if you're a person we've interacted a lot, you know, I talk about, you, I had to learn the difference between hearing the words and hearing the emotion, to Charlie's point. You know, when Zelda's reliving something, she's reliving the emotion of it. And she's just gonna basically really rapid fire words as they come up. And she might even question them later. I don't know why I said that. I don't know why I told that story. I don't know why this, right? But, and this is the feminine. It's just like, I feel something, let's reach for stories and words and, and things like that and then spout it out. And this is all coming out in the vomit bucket. And I'm tuned in as a man to like language and vocabulary. What did she say? What did she say? And, and I'm hearing the words spoken not the emotion. And because of this, even though I could repeat all the words back, I completely missed the emotion. Um, plus I have the whole perspective dominance thing happening. So I was focused on my perspective and maintaining my understanding of your words, but not actually maintaining any understanding of your emotion and what your heart was experiencing. Um, and so, yeah, you, you thought, you thought I didn't listen because I couldn't actually identify with the emotion of it. And then because I always took the time to carefully and I would slow down and mansplain my perspective. <laughs> no, it's a pyramid. <laughs> Yours is a square, it's wrong. This is a square and um, mansplain it. And then I would get done and be really proud about myself and how detailed and, and how I like thought ahead of all of the things she might be thinking. And I tried to like preemptively answer that. And she'd say, you always make it about you. You never listen. And I'd be like, <laughs> and I would want to kill myself because I was like, I don't know how to talk any more simply. Like my five-year-old could understand this. And that was your result or response. But what I, yeah, what I didn't understand was you needed me to hear your emotion and you needed me to stay with you 
in you sharing your story with me without going into my story. I didn't know how to do this actually for a long time. <laughs> and this is actually what we don't understand as men is when someone starts talking and you go to your story, you're really encountering insecurity. Um, and you're so damn used to it because you've been doing it since you're a little kid. It's the most natural thing in the world for you to do. You immediately go to what's my perspective. She says, Hey, here's my, here's my square. I said, well, I saw that as a pyramid. That shift I just did is like leaving the room when a woman is talking to you. She came into the room to share with you the square, going back to the image I shared a few minutes ago. When I leave the, you know, this, the conversation to go look for my perspective, I'm actually not with her anymore. My focus is not on her at all. It's on me. And this is why women say you always make it about you because you start telling your story. Well, she was telling me a story, right? So if I interrupt you every time you tell me a story, I'm like, oh no, I got one better. You know, I don't wanna hear your square story. I wanna tell you my pyramid story. If you look at it that way, it's really rude. Um, and it's really harming. Invalidating. Invalidating, yeah. So yeah, that was the, that was probably one of the bigger things I, I've learned in this journey about relating and it's really helped me as a father too I believe also because I know how much like if I were to order the kids in birth order I did this like you know the the youngest has really gotten the the benefit because <laughs> they've gotten the least amount of that but you know just who, who I was and how I knew how to relate um you know it's so different and it's gotten so much better by learning to just agree with myself so let's talk about practical because a lot of times this stuff is too ethereal what i do now is if someone starts telling me their perspective if i notice myself going there i just like no i just kind of say inwardly kind of self-coaching i'll think about this later it's not really necessary to think about right now insecurity and the ego will make you think it has to be addressed right now and you'll feel what you'll feel is the emotional bodily response of urgency and so urgency means you're living in your ego or your brain you're, you're having a brain body response to your thinking which subconsciously is most likely anxious and afraid that her perspective if it's different than mine puts me at risk that's what's in a nutshell happening so when i unwound all that in my life to where I no longer have the fear, anxiety, and insecurity, then I actually have the bandwidth to just be like, okay, she wants to tell a story. I love stories. Let's hear it. And not feel like it had to be, um, like I had to go look for mine. You know what I mean? Because that looking for mine was based on really the fear of losing love. It's like, oh shit, if you say something and it's not my perspective, you, I mean, you're doing this in nanoseconds and you're thinking, you might not actually love me. You might go away. We might not make it. I might not have love. And I'll die alone without that deep and consumed connection. I've been with. And you're having that kind of conclusion in your brain and like, like that. And so you feel, I got I to gotta share my perspective, right? And so I'm, I'm really conscious to, if I notice myself looking for my perspective, just, shh, just quieting and saying, I can look at that later. And I'm really conscious about not like trying to see if I'm using I me language, like if I'm that I'm not going to my to a story, and that the only way I really use I or me is is there anything you need for me right now, um, or is there anything I can do? But other than a question that has I or me, I try not to make statements. Um, if you are bringing something to me. And, and I kind of have, I would describe it as almost like there's an initiator of conversations. So I feel like if you come to me and you have something you want to talk about that's, that maybe feels like conflict or just you want to vomit in the bucket, if you initiated it, then I feel like anything I want to say needs to wait until later, unless you invite me by request. Like, because I think sometimes you will say, well, how do you feel about that? Well, then fine. That's fair. I can answer the question. Yeah. But if you didn't ask that of me, 
in my opinion, if I have a beef with it or something to say, I just go off and I try to think about it and I kind of just like let it percolate, try to sort it out. You know, did I have an ego response to that? Is my thinking actually match my values? And if I need to say it, then I'll come back later at, uh, at my initiation because then it's me initiating this kind of a you know connection time. And I don't know that that to me works. And if I may say something regarding all that, which is fantastic, I love sharing all of that. Um, <clears throat> and I think all of that play into all of our relationships with everyone. Yeah, sure. Just like the sure. idea of like quiet and listening, you know. Um, but <clears throat> what you were saying when I when I say like, what do you have to say? I have felt like in the last couple of years, like I want to do that more. Like I, I, I mean, I, I've always valued your opinion. As far as right. you know, because I think you're smart and intelligent and good, you know, have wisdom and, <laughs> and so many things, you know, areas of life, why not? So I've always valued that, but I may not have, have valued it. You know what I mean? If you were always wanting to show it. But sure. In, in the last couple of years where you're not just like always, then I find myself more free. Yeah. And it is like a sense of freedom in my spirit of like, oh, I'm thinking about these different things. I'd like to talk to Sven about them and then so the, just, just being present me. yeah allows then, you okay and then get your opinion yeah and okay. interesting because that's a much more harmonious way to do that than me just forcing that you know what I mean yeah and and I have mentioned this too in some conversations about this with other men and whatnot that yeah if you actually just accept the person and you just make yourself available, there is a really high probability that you will be asked what you think. And then that's an appropriate time right. to like to fill in your side of, of something. Um, I would still try to be rather limited, meaning I like to have a little bit more time. I'm happy to show, show, share with you in that moment what I think. But I personally prefer if I have any stirred up emotions to have more time meaning like to, that's just beneficial for me to have a chance to go get clear about my emotions only because i feel like if i share them in that moment i'm just pouring i'm pouring emotional energy on a on like a smoldering fire that i don't even understand which means it now becomes your responsibility and you know maybe some people like to relate to that like that i think that that doesn't really benefit us. It doesn't mean I don't share emotions with Zelda. It just means I'm careful not to share emotions I don't even understand that in any way could make her feel like she has to now be responsible for that. Um, you know what I mean? So, I mean, I, I value your input about things I'm unclear about, but I'm just saying if it's all stirred up and it feels like the water's all silty, to me, like sharing that with you doesn't really, yeah. it, it doesn't, there's nowhere to go with that. Yeah. Like, what can you, you do? To, like, yeah. Stew on it's it. yeah. So one of the, the um, things that was helpful for me was to hear the phrase, um, only one person is talking at a time, right? So so we get kind of wrapped up in this idea of having a, a, an interactive two-way conversation you know, you say something, I say something, you say something, I say something. But um, but sometimes, as you just said, it can get muddy, right? Because if, if, if we're, another way to say that, uh, an, an interactive conversation may be also seen as I'm reacting to you reacting to me reacting, yeah, right. right? Which, which now gets um, completely off topic, completely pulled away from, uh, because Maybe one person gets upset and then the other person reacts to that person getting upset and then so forth. But but if only one person is talking at a time, then the other person is listening. And um, if there's something that they need to um, think about or you know get clarity on, then they can do that later and then come back and say, hey, when you said that earlier, um, you know, this is I've, I've, I've thought about what you've said and this is this is what I think. Right. So now only one person is talking. Right. So the other yeah. person is listening. It, it, it really helped me to be able to, to kind of um, 
simplify it like that in my mind that only one person is talking at a time right yeah that's exactly what i meant charlie i appreciate yeah. that perspective all right well we have about uh just like three minutes left i want to spend the rest of the time just telling you about um something we want to share with you right and so realizing that maybe you had uh questions that you didn't get answered today or maybe you have other questions that have nothing to do with today's topic that you would love some response I would like to invite you just to go to spendmasterson.com slash contact and ask any question that you like, um, that you would like Zelda and I to answer. And what we'd like to offer you today, if you do that, is that we will make you just a brief personal video response where we'll talk about it like this. <laughs> we'll talk about the question. Um, so make sure it's, you know, it's, sure it's appropriate that I want to talk about it. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah. Nothing weird. This is not Dennis Collins' is called. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, so yeah, spendmasterson.com slash contact. Ask us, you know, a question maybe that you're curious about the feminine and masculine perspective. We will make a, bru a brief video. Um, usually they're like five to 10 minutes long. And we won't mention, we'll mention your first name, but we won't mention your whole name. We won't, we won't mention identifiable information. And then I will share that back with you in an email. There's no sales pitch in that email. Um, that's just a free thing for you. I will probably use the videos if they're good um, <laughs> elsewhere, but also- Only if that, you find it helpful. If you, well, let's see about that. <laughs> But also in that same email, I want to share with you a few more videos um, that I've already made that just talk about some of these topics like defensiveness, um, backstopping, which is me holding this bucket while you know Zelda or the woman in your life is just bringing emotion to you. What does backstopping mean? I'll share with you videos about you know needing to be right, and then I'll share with you in that email the article she mentioned from um, about you know, cleaning up the rooms of that, of that great house. So with that, again, I invite you, Charlie, I think it looks like you put that in the chat, maybe go to that page. Um, there's no sales flow. There's no sales pitch. You're not going to get really anything. It might ask you if you want to sign up for my newsletter, which I send out very rarely, but um, if you want to sign up for that, great. You'll find out about events like this. And with that, I want to just say, Thank you to Zelda for joining us. Um, she really has no idea usually what we're going to talk about. I, I, I sent out these topics, but I want you to appreciate, like, we don't spend any time talking about what are we going to talk about. I, I showed her the, the article. Of the article, yeah. And, um, and, I, and I shared with her just prior to the meeting the three points from the announcement. So she would have some idea what we were talking about, but she's had no time to think about this and prepare. Um, and so I, I am proud of the speech about that, that you can do that in front of a crowd of complete strangers from across the internet. <laughs> so, and then I wanna thank you for joining us, for giving us your time. Um, people always ask, is this gonna be recorded? Yes, it'll be recorded. I believe Good Guys to Great Men will post that in a few places and it'll most likely be on my YouTube channel um, by the end of the week. So with that, we'll wish you guys a good day. Thanks again for joining us and we'll talk soon. Take care. Bye.